From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Oren Vance. Oren Vance? Yeah, you sent me up to Arsening seven years ago, you remember? Huh? Oh, yes, I think I do. Uh, you know, I thought a lot about coming out and killing you, Dollar. Mm-hmm. But instead, I'm going to do you a favor. Yeah? Yeah. I think maybe you and I can work out something. You know, this sounds like double talk to me. Don't you give me any routine, Dollar. I heard them all. I'm calling you with information about the Todd case. Todd? I don't remember. Well, look it up. It cost your company $75,000. Hey. Hello? Vance? Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Four State Insurance Company, Wilmington, Delaware. Attention, Mr. Don Free, Chief Investigator Claims Division. Since your office authorized me to conduct certain inquiries based on new information supplied by Orrin Vance, I am billing you accordingly. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Todd matter. Expense account item one, one dollar and eighty-five cents. One phone call to Don Freed in Wilmington, Delaware, to discuss the burglary that had occurred six months before in the Long Island home of Norman Todd. The case was a complete stalemate. The police and the insurance investigators had been unable to locate the thieves or trace any of the loot, which included jewelry, silver, and wearing apparel that had been taken from the residence. I requested Don to forward whatever details they had, along with an accurate list of the stolen items and complete descriptions. Expense account item two, two dollars, cab fare. To and from the office of International Adjustment Bureau, where I refresh my memory concerning Orrin Vance. A good look at the files, and I remembered him well. Back in 1947, he'd been involved in a well-engineered swindle of the Seaman Clothing Company. Almost got away with it. And it was my investigation and testimony that finally put him behind the bars. Hi. Huh? Vance? Yeah. Oh, hello, Dollar. You haven't changed a bit. You have. Yeah, sure I have. You took seven years of my life away from me. Did you do what I told you to on the phone? People like you don't tell me what to do, Vance. Come on in. Oh, sure. Thanks. Nice place you got here. Yeah, I like it. Sit down. Tell me what's on your mind. Look, Dollar, don't treat me like a con, huh? Even if I am one. I'll sit down, yeah. I'll have a smoke with you. I'll talk with you. Okay. Okay, have one. Thanks. Uh, it's just that everybody, everybody's doing it. Treating me like that. Even my wife went over to see her the first day I got out. You know what? She wouldn't let me in the house. She gave me $40 and told me to go out and get a decent job. Work hard, she said, and in six months, if everything is okay and you're not in any trouble, you can come home to me and the kids. And if not, she says, I'm going to divorce you. Mm -hmm. What do you want me to say? Offer me a seat. Invite me to sit down. I'm a human being, too. Sure. Thanks again. Well? Well, I thought about it a lot. You know... If you hadn't been out to get me eight years ago, I, I might have had you over to dinner. Maybe we could have been friends. Yeah, maybe. Now, what's this all about, Vance? No. Okay. I can't get a job. I'll have to go in business for myself. I need a steak. That's why I called you. Go on. Now, did you do like I, like I asked you to? Look up the Todd case? I call Wilmington about it. There's nothing new happening. I'm happening. That's something new. And I can help for a price. All right, go on. But I want my name out of the picture. Could you fix that? Probably. But I'd have to talk to the police sooner or later. All I'm asking is your promise to keep my name out of it. Otherwise, it's no go. Well, tell me something about it before I make any promises, Vance. Fair enough. You got a list of the stolen items? Not yet. Won't be here until tomorrow. Now, when it gets here, you'll find it was a mink coat in that lot. I think most of it was jewelry, but it was a mink coat. Labeled from Zellerback Furs in New York... 
And the inside lining carried this serial number, 27356. All right. Take it easy, Vance. Expense account item three, $2.50. Another long-distance phone call to Wilmington and Don Freed, who verified that the serial numbers furnished by Orrin Vance fitted those in the stolen mink coat. I explained how I'd come about the information at hand, leaving out any mention of names. Freed talked with his boss and phoned me back a half an hour later. You can go ahead and work on it, Dollar. There's a $5,000 reward posted. $5,000? we will split it between you and, uh, and your friend, if anything worthwhile turns up. Okay? Uh, suppose it's nothing. Okay. Swindle sheet, too. All ah, right. Okay, Vance. You're in business. How does it work? You tell me where the coat is and who has it, and I'll handle it from there. If it turns out to be anything, you'll get paid for it. All I've had so far is talk. I'll tell you where the coat is and who has it, but before I do that, you give me a check. What? A check for 2500 You date it two days from now. I'll give you a chance to look into it and see if I know what I'm talking about. And you can stop payment any time within two days if my tip doesn't work out. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, I'll have the check and bye-bye. Where to? Homewood, Indiana. My plane leaves in an hour. I may want you around for some questions. No, I'll give you the tip. That's all. You ask somebody else the questions. Well? Okay. What's the matter? You afraid? Sure. Haven't you noticed? I'm a stool pigeon. I noticed, and it worried me. But I arranged for him to have the post-dated check in return for which he gave me a name and an address. Gloria Tierney, 1231 East 57th Street, New York City. Expense account item four, three dollars, cab fare to the airport. I saw Orrin Vance off on a westbound plane to Indiana. Forty-five minutes later, I boarded flight 37 for New York. Expense account item five, eighteen dollars, eighty-five cents. The cost of getting me from Hartford to New York. I checked in at the New Western and went directly to the Metropolitan Police Station where I asked if Gloria Tierney had a record. A check in the police files revealed that she was not listed. About 7 o'clock, I had a bite to eat, and then I walked over to the 57th Street address, a small apartment building. Here? Hello. I'm looking for Gloria Tierney. Oh, you have the wrong apartments right across the hall. I was over there. No one answered. Well, she must be out. I'm the manager here. Would you like to leave your name? I'm Johnny Dollar. But I wonder if you could tell me where to find her. No, no, I can't. But I'll be glad to give her your name and ask her to call you. Well, that sounds fair enough. I'm at the New Western Hotel. Oh, you're from out of town? Yes. An old friend of Gloria's? No, no, I'm uh, just on business. Well, I'll tell her you came by. Good, fine. By the way, uh, how long has Miss Tierney lived here? Mm, about a year. Why? Oh, I uh, just wondered. Thank you. Johnny Dollar, New Weston Hotel. Oh, uh-huh, that's right. Wait a minute. Here, take my card. Insurance? Sort of. The apartment house manager, it said Ethel Stromberg on the mailbox, smiled politely and closed the door. I went outside the building and took a plant across the street. I waited around for about three hours and saw no one go in or out of the building. I went back to my hotel. About midnight, the phone rang. Johnny Dollar. Hello, Mr. Dollar, please. I'm Mr. Dollar. You left word for me. I'm Gloria Tierney. Oh, yes, Miss Tierney. I intend to leave town, possibly in the morning, so I thought I'd better call you tonight. I hope it isn't too late. Not at all, Miss Tierney. What's it all about, Mr. Dollar? I'm an insurance investigator. I'd rather tell you about it in person. As I said, I expect to leave town tomorrow. Is it important? I think so, yes. Could I see you tonight? Well, I don't know. I could be there in 15 minutes. I don't understand. I'll come right over. Well, all right. I was there in less than 15 minutes, but things weren't all right. As a matter of fact, things looked all wrong. Gloria Tierney's apartment was darkened. She didn't answer when I knocked on the door. I tried it. The door was locked. You who? Hmm? Now, look here. I don't think you have any right to bother Gloria. 
Oh, it's you. Hello, Mrs. Stromberg. Well, where's Gloria? I don't know. You don't know? She was waiting to meet you. Ah. Well, out here in the hallway. She came in tonight, and I gave her your message. And then she went in and called you, and then came back out and said you were coming by. Yeah, well, she's gone. Well, that's funny. Hey, tell me, did you hear anyone out here? No. Well, maybe she went down to the drugstore. Drugstore's closed. Well, yes. Well, uh, she'll probably show up. Yes, probably. You look worried, Mrs. Stromberg. I am. Gloria didn't seem like herself when she came in. Oh, what do you mean? Well, she was nervous and upset. I think she'd been crying. I don't know. Uh Uh-huh. Oh, I hope she's all right. Yeah, so do I. You're sure she isn't outside waiting for you? No, I didn't see any. Well, I'll look again. Do you see her? Not a soul. Had she been drinking? No, of course not. What was she wearing, Mrs. Stromberg? Oh, she had her coat on. Her mink coat? Yes. Well, how'd you know about her mink coat? A friend of mine. I'll take a look around out here. All right. Oh, wait a minute. I'll come with you. You know, of course, she might have got... Wait a second. Look, is that Gloria? Why, yes, I think so. Something's wrong with her. Yes. The girl crossing the street in the mink coat weaves slightly from side to side. As I got close to her, I could see she was a pretty girl in her late 20s, blonde hair, dark eyes. She hardly looked up as I came up to her. Just stopped and stood there, weaving slightly. Miss Tinney? Yes. Yes. Well, can I help you? I'm Johnny Dollar. Please. Well, come on. We better go inside. Yes. What is it? He he struck me. He, He what? He struck me. And I... Oh, Mr. Dollar. There, come on. Careful now. Sure. Oh. Easy. Easy now. Thank you. Thank you very much. You okay? Yes. Look out! That car! Uh, What? That car! No! All three slugs had hit her and she fell back into my arms. By the time I could reach for it and get my gun out, the black Cadillac and whoever was driving it were out of sight around the corner. And there'd been no light on the rear license plate. Oh. Easy now, easy. Mr. Dollar, those were shots. Oh. What <gasps> Mr. Dollar? Call the police, call the police, quick. But I... Oh. Yes, right away. You know, let's see if we can... Mr. Dollar. Mr. Dollar. Don't try to talk, Gloria. Don't try to move. We'll have help here in a minute. Oh. 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 There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Todd matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, the same old business of murder, but with a brand new twist. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Dan Mapes, New York Police Department, Mr. Dollar. Oh, hi. I just went over your statement to the officers who went to the scene of the shooting. Pretty rough business. Yeah. How's the girl? She hasn't regained consciousness. We've got to get on with this, Dollar. There's some questions I want to ask you. Sure. Glad to do what I can. Where can I meet you? What's the matter with right here at headquarters? Okay. Say, in about an hour? Make it a half an hour. I said I want to get on with the case. Uh, Room 212, Sergeant Daniel Mapes. Okay, Sergeant. I'll be there. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Divorce State Insurance Company, Wilmington, Delaware. 
The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Todd matter. A burglary that occurred six months ago, but the murder try occurred only a few hours ago. Expense account item six, $16.40, one telegram. From me to Chief Investigator Don Freed for State Insurance. I explained events up to date and requested that Freed contact their New York office and employ counsel for me in the event the New York police chose to hold me as a material witness in the shooting of Gloria Tierney. Ah, we aren't going to hold you. Why should we? I don't know. Why should you? Sit down. Take it easy. Okay, thanks. So, uh, you're a freelance insurance investigator. Yeah, that's right. Working for four state out of Wilmington, huh? That's right. Okay, suppose you give it to me. Well, you got it right in front of you there in that report... I told it to the investigating officers right after the shooting last night. Yeah. Now you tell it to me. All right. I made an appointment to meet this girl. She called me about 12 o'clock midnight, and I went on over to her apartment. Uh-huh. She wasn't around when I got there, so I waited and talked to her landlady. A few minutes later, I saw her coming across the street. I went over to meet her because she looked like she'd been hurt or something. Mm. I walked her back across the street. Somebody pulled up in a car just as we got to the curb. It says here, Black Caddy, 1955 Coupe de Ville. Yeah, I didn't pay too much attention. What was the license number? Couldn't tell. It was blacked out. Okay, go on. There was a man in it. I didn't see his face. Didn't even notice him, really. He, well, he just started shooting. The girl was hit three times. I was trying to help her, and he got away. Well, what else? That's it. Okay. Tell me why you were in here yesterday afternoon checking to see if this Gloria Tierney had a record. I was about to contact her. I wanted to know if she'd ever been in trouble. Now tell me what you're working on. The Todd case. Todd? Yeah, burglary out in Long Island about six, seven months ago. I had reason to believe the girl might be able to help me on it. Hmm. Because of what? Because of her mink coat. Well, I'm glad you answered that way, Dollar. The coat's in the lab now. They're looking it over. We found it listed in our stolen property files. So far, your story is okay, but believe me, it isn't over yet. Huh? Tell me more. We know about the coat. We want to know about the girl who was wearing it. <sighs> Sorry, I can't help you. We didn't have her prints on file here, but we sent them off to Washington. She's still unconscious. She's in pretty bad shape. She can't talk. You can. What's her angle? I don't know. You don't know who shot her. You didn't get the license number. You just stood there and let it happen. All you were interested in was your mink coat. Look, I Is that what you're trying to tell me? I might be through trying to tell you anything, pal. Don't get smarty pants with me, Dollar. I got myself a shooting to straighten out. I'll straighten it out any way I can. What else did she have in the Todd business? You tell me. Nothing. A small diamond ring on a little finger. It's not on the stolen property list. Tell me, Dollar, did your insurance company pay off this claim? Yes, the whole thing. About 75000 75000 That's right. Well, at least you got the coat back. Even if it has got three bullet holes in it. Maybe we'll get a line on the whole job. If she regains consciousness. Meanwhile, you can sit here and tell me about your tip. What? Who put you on to Gloria Tierney? No, no, I'm, I'm afraid I can't tell you that. Why not? Because I promised not to disclose any names. Oh, for... I can tell you this much, though. The man who told me about Gloria Tierney couldn't possibly have had anything to do with the Todd case. He was in prison when it happened. Let's have his name so I can check it. He's in Indiana now. He's got a name in Indiana. What is it? Sorry. You going to sit there and tell me he gave you a name to start with and that's all you bought? Yep. Suppose I told you I don't believe anything. And then I think I'll hold you for a while until you forget about whatever deal you made with an ex-con. Well, suppose I told you that a lawyer for my insurance company is on his way down here right now just to see that I get treated right. <laughs> What's funny? You. You insurance guys. You know what? You give me a pain. Right here. We went on like that a little while. Then I accompanied Sergeant Mapes to Gloria Tierney's apartment. A full crew of technicians were there giving the premises a complete check. Mapes dispatched two sets of detectives to cover the neighborhood for possible witnesses to the shooting. Another pair began to cover the apartment house itself. I went with Mapes to talk to the manager, Mrs. Stromberg. She looked white and shaken. You remember, Mr. Dollar? Yes. Hello, Mr. Dollar. 
How's poor Gloria? Not very good, Mrs. Stromberg. She's still unconscious. And we're still pretty much in the dark about all this, Mrs. Stromberg. Where is she? What hospital? I'd like to go see her. Maybe there's something I can do. Best thing you can do is try to help us find out who shot her. She's at the police emergency hospital right now, Mrs. Stromberg. I'll have them phone you when she can see people. Thank you. Oh, what an awful thing. She... Well, what's it all about? Why would anyone want to shoot Gloria? We hope we can ask her that question. Right now, we're going to try to find out all we can, and maybe you can help us. Well, I hope so. What can I tell you? Where she worked, how she lived, what people she knew. Oh, dear. Yesterday, you told me you'd known her for a year. Yes, ever since she moved in. All right. Was she a nice girl? Of course she was a nice girl. Quiet, minded her own business. Where she work at? Well, I don't know. I mean, Gloria doesn't work as far as I know. Who pays her rent? She always gave me a check. Who gave her a check? Well, I really don't know. I Don't you know anything? What's the matter with you? Well, I'm trying. Mapes, no. why don't you go sit down? All right, I'll sit down here. Mrs. Stromberg, what can you tell us about her? Do you know how we can contact her family? Think about it. Well, I don't know. I know they live in California somewhere, but that's all I do know. She talked about them now and then. Uh-huh. How about her friends here in town? What about them? Well, for instance, the man who drove the black Cadillac last night. I never saw that car around here before. Did she talk about her friends to you? Why, no. She's a pretty girl, young. Boyfriends? Oh, yes, she did talk about them now and then. Do you suppose one of them had something to do with this? Mrs. Stromberg, some guy pulled up in a black caddy last night and pumped three slugs into her. She acted funny before that, according to you. Run out when she was supposed to meet Dollar here. Don't you know if any of her friends drove a car like that? No. You know this, but you don't know that. What kind of a friend were you? What? What kind of a friend were you? That girl's lying in a hospital right now. She's got a slug here, another one here, and here. They've operated twice. You weep and holler and stand around wringing your hands about her, but you won't open your mouth about helping us find who did it. Now, let's start with that car again. You've got the front apartment here. You can see the street from those two windows. Have you ever seen that black caddy here before? Yes. Well, why didn't you say so in the first place? Whose is it? I don't know. I mean, I don't know his full name. Well, what do you know about him? His name is Bill something. <laughs> Bill something. Yes. That's a big help. What does he look like? Where does he work? What does he do? I don't know. I really don't know. She never introduced me to him, but she talked about him. She'd say, Bill's coming by tonight, or Bill did this, or Bill did that, but she never mentioned his last name. But he drove the caddy. Yes. Now, what does he look like? I told you, she never introduced me. I heard that part. But I know if someone young and fresh and pretty like Gloria Tierney lived across the hall from my wife, my wife would be at the window every time she heard the bell ring or heard a car drive up out front. She'd want to see who was buying her the candy and flowers, who was knocking on the door. Isn't that so, Mrs. Stromberg? Yes. I mean, no. Yes. Well, what do you mean? Now, look. For the third time, what does this guy, Bill, look like? Well, he's tall and very dark. Tall? What does that mean? Tall like me? Tall like Dollar? Tall like what? Like Mr. Dollar. How old? How'd he dress? What kind of bill? Easy, easy, Mapes. Why don't you go through that offering me to sit down part now? All right, all right. I was wrong about you, Mapes. I admit it. Well, maybe I was kind of wrong about you, Dollar. Hardly anybody ever admits anything these days. Okay. I'm sorry I'm raising my voice, Mrs. Stromberg. But tell us about the man, all you can remember about Bill. Heavy? Light? A husky fellow, and he dressed very nicely, too. What color was his hair? Dark, I think. He always wore a hat. How about his eyes? I don't know. Uh Uh-huh. About how old would you say? Oh, 30, maybe 35. I'm not very good at ages. How often did he come here to see her? Oh, once or twice a week. Gloria's been going with him? Yes. Did she ever mention where he works or what he does? No. No, she never mentioned that. Do you have any idea how long she's known him? How long she's been going with him? Well, I have no idea. I just know he's been coming to see her ever since she moved in here. This, uh, Bill. Would you say he had money, Mrs. Stromberg? Yes, I'd say so. He drove that big expensive car and always dressed so nice. And, of course, he gave Gloria that coat. The mink coat? Yes. Oh. Do you know if he ever gave her any jewelry? I don't know. I don't think so. Gloria would usually run across the hall and show me when he gave her something. Mostly they were small gifts, candy, and things like that. But I don't remember if he ever gave her any jewelry. 
Did he ever bring any friends here? I don't know. All right. Was Gloria going to marry him? Well, she never talked about it. You sure about that? Yes, she never said, and I never asked. Why? Why not? Well, I don't know. I never asked her. I wanted to, but I never asked her. You think right away I've been a busybody watching that girl and so on. Well, yes, I watched her from time to time, and I was her friend here. But there are some things we just didn't talk about. There sure were. Well, as you ask me questions, I realize how much we didn't talk about. I can't tell you where she came from or where her family is or who Bill is or what she planned for the future. I just know she was a nice, decent, honest sort of a girl. Yes, we got that impression, Mrs. Stromberg. Anything you want to ask, Dolly? No, no, no. My uh, apologies again for raising my voice. Thank you for the information, Mrs. Stromberg. Hmm. Come on, Dolly. Okay. Goodbye. 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 Well, you got it out of her. Yeah, but I don't trust her. It took too much work. Are you really as tough as you look? Sure. <laughs> You're a good cop, mates. <laughs> Thanks. I like to have somebody mention that every five years. Well, better get out this guy's description. Yeah. Now, there's a hall phone right there. Uh-huh. Well, we sure haven't got much to go on. Communications, please. Here's Dan Mapes. I want an APB out on... What? Oh, I'll give it to you later. Johnny, the uh, hospital phoned in two minutes ago. Gloria. Yes. They think she's dying. <laughs> There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Todd matter tomorrow. Tomorrow, I take some lessons from a good policeman on how to find out what has to be found out. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Dr. King, Police Emergency Hospital. You left word for me to call you, Mr. Dollar? Yes, sir. I'm with Sergeant Mapes. Has there been any change in Miss Tierney's condition? No, sir. No, none. Do you think she'll make it, Doctor? Hard to say right now. Sometimes they rally. Sometimes not at all. Doctor, it's very important that we see her. I don't know whether to do any good, Mr. Dollar. We want to question her. Yes, I know, I know. Oh, why don't you and Sergeant Mapes come on over to the hospital? All right, sir, we'll be right there. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Four State Insurance Company, Wilmington, Delaware. The following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Todd matter. The burglary that resulted in a shooting. On a tip from an ex-convict named Orrin Vance, I came to New York to question one Gloria Tierney. My information was that she had in her possession an expensive mink coat. Part of a $75,000 burglary at the Todd home on Long Island. Gloria Tierney was shot and seriously wounded by an unknown gunman before I was able to question her about the coat. A description of her assailant and how she had obtained the coat were still to be ascertained when Sergeant Dan Mapes and I arrived on the second floor of emergency hospital. Mr. Dollar? Yes. Oh, I'm Dr. King. Oh, yes, this is Sergeant Mapes. How do you do? Has she managed to talk yet, Doctor? No, and she may not. I see. Now, before we go in, I hope both of you will carefully frame only your most pertinent questions. Two minutes is about all I can give you with her. Sure, Doctor. 
Uh, oh, better put your cigarettes out in there. Oh, oh, yeah. Ego facultate mihi ab apostolia sede tributa indulgentiam plenarium et remissionem omnium peccatorem tibi concedo. Father Deering wanted in his word. Yeah. Et fili et spiritus sancti. Amen. All right, Father? Yes. Hmm. Is she conscious? Just a minute. Yes? She can hear you, I'm sure. You want to go ahead? I suppose so. Has to be official. Are you Gloria Tierney? Is Gloria Tierney your name? Do you understand that you are seriously hurt? Do you understand that? Yes. Can you tell us how you came about these injuries, Miss Tierney? Oh. Miss Tierney. Oh. Bill. Bill. Bill shot you? Yes. Well, what is Bill's full name? Where can we find him? Bill. Where can we find him? Who is he? Doctor, watch out. Nurse, hand me the hypo. Rick! No? This might help. Sorry, fellows. Nothing more I could do. Gloria Tierney died at 3.35 in the afternoon without revealing the full name of the man who had shot her the night before. Expense account item seven, six bucks, drinks. Myself and Sergeant Mapes. Well, we're sure of two things. Are we? Yeah. His name's Bill. This is the worst whiskey I ever tasted. Uh, there ought to be a law. I think there is, Sergeant. I'm going to ask you something, baby. Outside of the fact that that girl up there died a few minutes ago and was wearing a stolen mink worth $11,000 that you've been wanting to get your hands on, what about her? How does it strike you? She looked like a nice girl. Yeah. She looked like the best kind of girl ever made. What else? What would someone like that be doing in a stolen mink coat? Exactly. What would she be doing with a stolen mink coat? Outside of having herself a time with a guy named Bill who gave it to her. You call that having herself a time? I'd like to get drunk. Every bum in town's named Bill. This is bad. Terrible. Worst stuff I ever drank. You can say that again, baby. Worst stuff I ever drank. Waiter. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Bring us two more of the same. Only make them double. Yes, sir. Right away, sir. I'm glad to see you aren't fussy, Dolly. Not a bit. Not a lousy bit. You know, I looked at you when you came in my office and I said to myself... I got a wiseacre on my hands. Huh? I got a wheeling, dealing wiseacre who's got himself a little tip and he's going to keep it all to himself. I said, why do I have to put up with this kind of trouble? Why don't I just toss this bum in the cooler and go about my business? I'm a copper. I got work to do. Why fool with an insurance stick, I said. <laughs> But I'm very happy to see you aren't a fussy fella, baby. Very happy. All right. You made a speech. No, I'll make one. Go ahead. Well, I stood in a hospital room and I watched a human being die. Oh, it's part of my job, part of your job, too. But for myself, I don't like it. 
If I have to go into why every man's death diminishes me, I'm going to fall all over myself because I never could go into that kind of stuff. Yeah, I know what you mean. But I'll say this. That girl that died in there was... Well, she was the kind of girl I could have kept right on scene. Yes, I'd like very much to have knocked on her door almost any old night. Sergeant, I would have liked that more than I could tell. She wore a stolen mink coat. Remember? I remember. I remember. But I can sit here and feel bad about it, can I? You sure can. I'll feel bad with you. Eh, look at them early eaters, Dollar. Coming in to drink their dinners. Don't change the subject. I have to. We well, got work to do, pal. Yeah. Here we are, gentlemen. Well, as long as it's here. Yeah. Cheers. Cheers yourself. <coughs> oh, well, there ought to be a law. You said that. I remained with Sergeant Mapes the rest of the day as he continued his investigation of the death of Gloria Tierney in the Todd burglary. The apartment where she'd lived finally yielded some information. Here. Here it is. Letters from Robert J. Tierney in Riverside, California. Looks like her father, maybe. Yeah. I'll have the business office down at headquarters notify him. Hey, what's this? Huh? Picture. Mm hmm. Nice looking guy. Yeah. Love Bill. <laughs> he loved her all right. Anybody identified this yet? That uh, Mrs. Stromberg's supposed to be here right now. What time you got? I passed. She said she'd be here at six. Hey, Sergeant, did you get anything on the bullets? Well, they didn't check with anything in our lab. Ballistic says it was an Army Colt, old model. Pretty good for killing. And what gun isn't? Yeah, you're right. Hello? Oh, hello, Mrs. Stromberg. We've been waiting for you. Come in. Hello? Hello, Mr. Dollar. Hi. Do I have to answer any more questions? Oh, a couple, if you don't mind. I'm just all worn out. I can't get over this terrible thing happening to Gloria. Did you ever find out about her family? We're going to contact them right now. Seems they live in Riverside, California. Yes. Yes, I believe that's what she said. I want to ask you one question, Mrs. Stromberg. Take a look at this picture. Yes. Do you know him? Oh, yes, that's Bill. The man Gloria Tierney's been going out with these last few months? Yes. The man who drives the black Cadillac? Yes, the Cadillac. Oh, I wish I could tell you his full name. Did he do this terrible thing? It looks like it, Mrs. Stromberg. Oh, dear. Have you arrested him yet? We haven't found him yet. Well, I hope you do. I hope you clear this up. I left word for the office to get me here. What about her things? Hello. Her family will probably take charge as soon as they're contacted. Oh, that poor girl. That poor girl. So alone now. Yeah. Uh, Mrs. Stromberg, did Gloria Tierney ever mention to you that she'd been married? Married? Gloria? Yeah. Why, no, she never mentioned it. Was she? Married in the state of New York in 1951. Divorced in 1953. Routine check of vital statistics. What was her husband's name? Bill. Bill Powers. Sergeant Mapes requested immediate file checks on William B. Powers, the ex-husband of Gloria Tierney. From it, he learned he had no criminal record in the state of New York. His home address was up in Westchester County, one of the suburbs of the big city. I drove out there with Sergeant Mapes. Oh, what's this all about? Do you know a woman named Gloria Tierney, Mr. Powers? Well, sure. We were married once. Why? She was shot to death last night, Mr. Powers. A Gloria? Yeah. Are you sure? We're sure. Shot? Oh, well, what, 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 what happened? How could a thing like that happen? That's what we're trying to find out, Mr. Powers. I can't believe it. Glory, it... Have you seen her lately? What? Have you? What? Uh, yes. I saw her last week. We had a drink together. Are you sure it's Glory? We'd make sure before we came here with news like that. That's right. Mr. Dollar here isn't a policeman. He's an insurance investigator. Miss Tierney was wearing a stolen mink coat when it happened. Stolen? Are you sure? We're sure. We checked everything, well, Mr. Gloria Powers. would never steal anything. She was a fine girl. A wonderful girl. 
fool to ever let our marriage go on the rocks. Can you come with us, Mr. Powers? We'd like an identification. What? Oh, uh, yes, of course. I'll, I'll, I'll get my coat. Excuse me. Want to smoke, Johnny? Yeah, thanks. Well, he isn't the bird in the picture, Johnny. No, not at all. Still, he... What is it, Johnny? You check the driveway out there? No. Take a look, the side window. Uh-oh. Yeah. 55 Cadillac Coupe de Ville. Sure is, Sergeant. There'll be another intriguing episode in our story of the Todd matter tomorrow. Tomorrow? Well, you find one killer and you find them all. And then? Then you have to start all over again. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Long distance operator, Wilmington, Delaware, is calling you. Okay. Go ahead, please. Johnny? I do. Well, this is Don Freed. What's happening there? Your expenses are running away up and we haven't gotten a report from you. I've been too busy. What's that supposed to mean? That's supposed to mean that the tip I got was good and it was bad. Yes, Gloria Tierney, 1231 East 57th Street, had a mink coat that was stolen from the Todd estate. No, she didn't tell me much about it because she got herself shot down in the street last night. Yes, I'm working with the police here trying to find out how she comes by the coat. But what I want... Listen, an hour ago I went out to see an ex-husband of hers. His name's Bill Powers, and he seems to be the bird we're looking for. You know what he did? He cried and blubbered all the way down to the morgue. And he's in there right now making a positive identification. I don't blame him for crying. So what's new with you, Mr. Expense Account? Boy, you're a real man-eater today, aren't you? I sure am. Bye. <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Four State Insurance Company, Wilmington, Delaware. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Todd matter. Expense account item eight, 20 cents, aspirin. I bought them in a drugstore across the street from the morgue. I figure I needed them. On the way down in the police car, the ex-husband of Gloria Tierney gave us a very little information about her activities up until the time of her death. After he made the identification, we all walked across the street. Expense account item nine, 30 cents, three cups of coffee. Sergeant Mapes, Bill Powers, and myself. Powers cried a while, then straightened out somewhat. I hope you get whoever... Whoever did this terrible thing, Sergeant, I hope you'll get him real fast. You sure want to, Mr. Powers. Why would anybody do that to Gloria? Why? Maybe you can help us answer that. We hope you can, Mr. Powers. Oh, you. You're just interested in that coat she was wearing. Well, mister, I don't believe she was wearing a stolen coat. What do you think of that? I think that's a pretty fair way to think right now. But it's not very practical since we already have proof that it is a stolen fur and that she was wearing it. Yeah. How about some more coffee? That's cold. What? Oh, no. Look, we're just trying for the facts of the matter, Mr. Powers. I saw Gloria Tierney. I know what kind of a person she was. We have to start somewhere. You can understand that. Yeah, I suppose so. Now, you told us you saw her last week for a drink. That's right. Have you been seeing her right along? Yeah, sure. Even though you were divorced a year or so ago? Yeah. Yeah. Did you know she's been going with someone else, too? Yeah. Bill? Yeah. Bill Chambers. Is that his name, Bill Chambers? 
Well, yeah, I don't know him, but she talked about him a lot. Here, take a look at this picture. Is this him? Yeah, that's him. I thought you knew. You're sure this is him? Oh, sure. The picture was in her apartment. I've seen it there. One day I asked her who he was, and Gloria told me about him. Well, what did she tell you about him? She just said she was going out with him. Oh, well, she told me that he asked her to marry him. She said he had a lot of money. Anything else? Oh, uh, I don't know. Did she happen to mention where he works? No. What kind of work he does? No. Do you know where we can get in touch with him? No, no, I don't know that either. I, I can't help you. I only know she's been going out with him. Hmm. I don't get this. You and her were divorced, but you kept on seeing her. And she got this new boyfriend. And she told you things like that? Yeah. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? Why'd you bust up? Well, all this and that. Kid stuff. I suppose. Spat over this and that. I don't know what exactly. Anyway, we were going to straighten it out. We were going to be married again. Oh, what about this Bill Chambers? No, she didn't want to marry him. She wanted to marry me again. She told me. When? Day before yesterday. She said she... She said she would marry me. Now she's dead. You know what kind of a car Chambers drives? Uh, oh, well, she... A Cadillac. How do you know that? Oh, she told me about his car. Another thing, I went out and I bought one myself just like his. I thought it might do me some good with her. We were crazy, weren't we? Where were you last night? Home. Can you prove it? Oh, yeah. Home. All night. I was home while she was out. Getting yourself killed. The name William Chambers was checked through the New York police files. Twenty-four persons more or less fit the general description of the suspect. It took two days for Sergeant Mapes and his men to track down all the leads. Neither Mrs. Stromberg or Bill Powers could identify any of them. An all-points bulletin was issued describing the suspect in his car. Same results, Nothing. On the third day, the pawn shop detail turned up two items that had been taken in the Todd burglary. Uh, There they are, Johnny. Uh Uh-huh. Watch and a ring. Todd lost a watch and a ring with a lot of other stuff. Case numbers in the watch check out. The ring's engraved. Uh Uh-huh, yeah. Where were they picked up? Shop on 3rd Street. The proprietor bought them yesterday. A man who signed the buy book used the name James Agenian. Phony? Yeah. Gave an address on Polk Street. That was phony, too. We got a good description from the proprietor. Fits Chambers right down the line. Oh, then he was still in town yesterday. Yesterday, yeah. But this stuff's been on the hot sheet for a long time. If he's had any experience at all, he knew he was taking a chance trying to unload it. Probably trying to raise money to get out of town. What I was thinking. Well, if he keeps on trying to raise money and unload all these things, I'll have all the loot back. If he keeps on trying, we'll keep on trying. Johnny, we're going to get this, baby. Sergeant Mapes. Where? Okay. He does need money. Huh? They found his car. Used car lot up in the Bronx. He sold it at 10 o'clock this morning. At the used car lot, we learned that a man answering the description of William Chambers had driven in that morning and offered a black 55 Cadillac for sale. The used car lot manager had finally settled on a price and made out a check. He reported that Chambers seemed extremely nervous and anxious to make a quick deal. The car was impounded and examined. A full set of fingerprints on the steering wheel and dashboard gave us a positive identification on William Chambers. Oh, what do you know? William Charles, William Carls, William Charles, Walter Cameron. One, two, three, seven aliases. Real name, William Charles. Male, Caucasian, age 33. 17861. Let's see. 14 arrests, two convictions. Both car thefts. Hmm. Quite a boy. Well, we got a real tag on him now. Shouldn't be long before we pick him up. Hmm. It doesn't look like a killer, does he, Jenny? I don't know. What's a killer supposed to look like? The search for William Charles continued. Associates and relatives listed in his criminal file were contacted and questioned. All denied knowledge of his whereabouts. 
In the meantime, two more pieces of stolen property connected with a Todd burglary were recovered by the pawn shop detail. Expense account item 10, $3, one telegram to four state insurance in Wilmington. Explaining our progress in the case and listing the recovered items. Johnny Dollar. Are you interested in finding Bill Charles? Who's this? My name's... Never mind. Do you want him or don't you? Sure I want him. I'm at Traft's restaurant on 42nd off Broadway. Can you meet me? Yeah. Fifteen minutes. I'm in a gray suit, pinstripe. I'll be sitting alone. I'll watch for you. Expense account item 11, 75 cents, cab fare. From my hotel to Schraff's restaurant. A small, pretty brunette woman in nice clothes was seated at a table all alone. She looked more like a housewife on a shopping tour than someone who might be connected with a bandit and a killer. Sit down, Mr. Dollar. Okay, sure. There's a reward posted for William Charles, isn't there? For that Todd matter? That's right. $5,000. Well, I get it if I turn him over to the police. Not all of it. Half of it goes to an ex-convict who tipped me off in the first place. Half? Yes. You don't seem very anxious to get him. Oh, we're anxious. That's the way it is. This other half of the 5000 is spoken for. I want to get something else straight. What happens to me? What do you mean? I've known he had a part in that Todd matter for a long while. I haven't said anything. Does that make me a party to it or something? I don't know. Well, this is going to get me in trouble. If I have to spend the money for lawyers to keep out of jail, I don't want any part of it. All right. My company will cover that part. Now, where's Charles? Not so fast. I better have something in writing. Something that says your insurance company will pay me a reward and give me help if I get in trouble. I'll talk to them. I'm thinking of the future. I'm going to have one once this is over. Are you? Yes. Yes, I am. Now, how long will it take you to arrange this? Oh, about an hour. I can do it by phone, I guess. That'll be fine. Who are you? Melva Charles. His wife? Yes, that's right. $2,500. Not much for a husband. He's not much of a husband. He was once, but then he had to give away a mink coat and spend time away from me. I see. I doubt it. You people hardly ever see anything. We try. You make the arrangements. I'll meet you again in, say, two hours. Two hours. I gave her a 50-second start before I left the table. When I got out on the street, I was just in time to see her climb into a cab. I was trying to hail one to follow her when a black coupe pulled up to the curbing. Come on in, baby. Hey, Mapes. Get in. The light's changing. That is Melva Charles in that cab up there. Yeah, that's who she said she was. She wants to sell you her husband for the reward, doesn't she? Yeah. What's the delay? She wants to be sure she'll be handled right, the money and all. Say, how did you get in on this? <laughs> Very dirty trick, baby. Everybody my men questioned about Charles mentioned your name, where you were staying, and what interest the insurance company had in this matter. Somebody was bound to look you up, especially Mrs. Charles. So we've kept an eye on you. Now where are we, Sergeant? Her name was Melva Thaler before she married Charles. Her old man had a pot of money back in Minnesota. But she couldn't keep out of trouble and got herself disinherited. Money's always been her problem. Isn't it everybody's problem? Not the way it is with her. You should see her record. How much you offer? Half. The other's spoken for. Twenty-five hundred dollars. Well, Charles is no good to her now. If he sticks his head out, he'll get caught. So she might as well cash in what she can on him. Hmm. Nice people, huh? Swell. Uh-oh, she's leaving the cab. Get down to the corner and park. Can you see her? She went into the apartment building. Let's go. Which apartment, Johnny? Here we go. Right. Nowhere. Beats me. Just a minute. Johnny! Now, uh, what? Before I went down, I heard it go off a couple more times. It must have been six inches from my head. My eyes couldn't see, and my feet couldn't move. But I could hear. Johnny! Hold on! Hold on, baby! <laughs> There'll be another exciting episode in our story of the Todd Matter tomorrow. Tomorrow? Well, there are times when $75,000 worth of stealing isn't worth a plug nickel. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, 
Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure and join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Hi, baby. Dan Mapes. Glad they gave you a telephone in your room. Yeah, that's the only thing good about it. Well, hospitals are designed to make a man impatient. You're a pretty lucky fella at that. Let me tell you about your operation. Yeah, please do. You stopped two slugs. They fried one out of your neck and another one out of your rib cage. Missed your heart by a snake's whisker. I was luckier than Gloria Tierney. Yeah, yes you were. I'm on my way up to see you. Don't run out on me. Oh, fat chance. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Four State Insurance Company, Wilmington, Delaware. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Todd matter. Expense account item 11, $3.05, breakfast. I got mad at the nurse when she brought in a bowl of hot cereal and a glass of milk. So I bribed an orderly to slip across the street and get me a tray of bacon and eggs. I was just finishing, same, when up came Sergeant Mapes. He looked haggard and tired and worried. You nearly got it for good, baby. I got enough of it. You sure did. What do you remember, if anything? Well, we tailed Melba Charles to an apartment house. We stepped inside, and somebody began trying to kill me. And that's when I left town. Yeah, it was quite a mess. Coroner had a real job in his hands. Yeah. Hey, how about you? Not a scratch. Coroner, did you say? Yeah. Melva Charles got it. Her husband stuffed a butcher knife in her back. Oh. That was for trying to sell him out to you. Yeah. Yeah, maybe he thought he was worth more than 2500 Maybe. A man named Henderson, who happened to be walking down the hall at the wrong minute, took three in the head. He was dead before he hit the floor. Oh. woman on the street got hit. Not too bad. Two people outside just getting into a car got cut up pretty bad when bullets smashed their windshield. You keeping track of all this? I'm trying to. This all happened after we got there, huh? Yeah. You see, when you and I walked in there, William Charles had just finished killing his wife. He saw us and began pumping. You got hit, and I pumped back at him. You get him? Yeah, but not till he had shot up everybody else. He's on the floor above you, hanging on by a hair. He knew his ticket was up, and he just didn't care. It's my fault you're here, baby. I'd, I'd have rather cut off my arm than get you in on this. What do you mean? Well, tagging you and going after her. I didn't use my head. You know what? What? <laughs> I still think you're a pretty good copper, Mapes. <laughs> Thanks, Johnny. Here, I uh, brought you a book of poetry. Poetry? Read. Take it easy. We'll be talking again soon. I felt awful. Sergeant Mapes dropped in later that afternoon, but I was half asleep. Vaguely, I remember they wheelchaired me down the hall for x-rays and lab tests. Expense account item 12, 10 cents, the morning paper. The story of the shooting was splashed all over page one, and the solution to the Gloria Tierney killing in part. Slugs from William Charles' gun were matched with those that had killed Gloria Tierney. No mention was made of any loot from the Todd burglary being found in the Charles apartment. Between back rubs and sleeping pills, I worried about that. I didn't worry too much about the fact that William Charles, killer, gunman, burglar, was dying in the room directly above me. About midnight, Mafe showed up with a wheelchair. There we are. Now, you all ready to go up and see what he has to say? Yeah, sure, I guess so. I still have to finish my job. Uh, let's take it easy now. All right. Hey, weak. Is it? That won't last long. There. Now, here we go, baby. 
It was the second time within a week I'd been in a hospital room with a dying person. The first one had been a young and beautiful woman who had been shot by the man who now lay dying of police bullets. What did they... What did they say? You know what they say, Charles. You haven't got a prayer. I didn't mean to kill Gloria. I didn't mean it at all. I want you to know that. You took a lot of pains to do it. I was there, remember? Yeah, I remember. Sorry. Been doing pretty good with those those house jobs at Todd Place, another one in St. Louis. Doing all right. Enough to buy a nice car, live in a decent place, get around a little bit. Work all along. Met her. I liked her, wanted to marry her. I did. Really did. You already had a wife. You think I'm kidding? I gave her a mink coat, didn't I? Thought that it cinch. She didn't want to take it. Told me she was going to marry some other guy. Some guy she'd been married to before. I got mad. I came back that night, let her have it. At all? <laughs> yeah, that's all. That's it. That's it, mister. You take it or leave it. How did you meet her? <laughs> Mutual friend. What friend? Ah, uh, none of your business. All right, this is my business. Where's the rest of the stuff? What stuff? The stuff you took from the Todd place. <laughs> Where have you got it? <laughs> oh, what's funny? You, you think I'd tell you that? Oh, well, what's the difference now? Uh, <laughs> Come on, what's the difference now? <laughs> oh, it's a laugh, you know. You know what? I'd die before I tell you. <laughs> He died, and he didn't tell me. Not a word. Later, a private ambulance took me from police emergency hospital to my hotel room. Three days after that, I was able to get back on my feet. I went right down to Mapes' office at headquarters. How do you feel? Ah, uh, better now. Boy, you sure look lousy. Here, sit down, baby. All right, thanks. <laughs> Should you be out of bed? Yeah, sure, sure. You're lying and you know it. Oh, I suppose so. Well, how's it going? You mean have we located the rest of the stuff? No, not a lick of it. <laughs> Funny guy, wasn't he? He had his last laugh. Well, you shouldn't be worrying about this stuff now. You ought to be taking care of yourself. I am. I'm sitting here helping you worry. I'm not worried about anything. You're worried about the same thing I am. Where's all the rest of the Todd stuff? Oh, uh, it'll turn up somewhere. Why, Mr. Dollar. Hello, Mrs. Stromberg. I read about what happened to you in the papers. I'm sorry. I'm terribly sorry. Oh, well, I'm better now. Well, come in. Come in, please. Thanks. Say, you, you'd better sit down, Mr. Dollar. I'll get you a cup of coffee. Uh, do you have any bourbon? Why, yes, I think so. All right, so. I'll take that. Well, all right. Is water okay? Yeah, sure, fine. Should you be out of bed, Mr. Dollar? You know, everybody asks that. No, no, I shouldn't, and yet I should. Well, here you are. Oh, thanks. Well, here's cheers. Remember the night Gloria was shot? Of course, very well. You know, I've been worried about that night. Huh? Uh-huh. Remember I came over here and I told you I was in the insurance business and you said you'd have her call me when she came in? Yes. Well, I remember pretty clearly you said you'd have her call me when she came in, not if you saw her come in. Yes, did I? Uh-huh. You saw to it that she called me, Mrs. Stromberg. You also saw to it that she wasn't here to meet me when I got here. She was out, out there somewhere. Because by then you knew I was an insurance investigator. I don't understand you, Mr. Dollar. You what are you trying to You sent her out so he could take care of her. And you were waiting in the hall for me. Waiting for you? Why, no, I happened to see you, and I wondered You wondered what... what kind of cock and bull story you could give me to get rid of me. That's silly. I sound that way. <sighs> That's a good drink. 
But not so silly if you knew that coat she was wearing was stolen and that I was after it and her. How would I possibly know that? Because you introduced her to one of your friends one night and he went overboard for her. And eventually he gave her that little present. Are you saying that I had anything to do with Gloria's trouble? Yeah. Why, that's silly. Oh, here's something sillier. A small-time burglar and thief lay in a hospital bed yesterday and wouldn't tell me how he met Gloria Tierney. Oh, he was a real gallant one, this bird. He killed an innocent girl because she was wearing a mink coat and might tell me who gave it to her. Mr. Dollar. He shot up two or three people in an apartment, including me. He got shot himself. He knew he was dying. But a simple thing like telling me how he met her wouldn't come out. He wouldn't tell me that for anything. Now, where could he meet her? Was he her kind? Did he go in the same circles? Did he? Nah. He was introduced by a mutual friend, Mrs. Stromberg. You, the manager of the apartment house. No. Something else he wouldn't tell me. What happened to the rest of the loot from the Todd burglary? Two things he wouldn't tell me. He didn't have to when I sat down and thought it out. You've been working with him right along. You've been keeping all the stuff here. Oh, that's fantastic. Not so fantastic at all, Mrs. Stromberg, when you think that his wife, and she was a girl who'd do anything for money, they tell me, was willing to sell him to me for 2500 bucks. <laughs> 2500 bucks. when there's still over $60,000 worth of loot from the Todd burglary lying around. She didn't know where it was, but you do, Mrs. Stromberg. Well, if you say I do, I do. Now what? Let's go down to Sergeant Mapes. Oh, no, I... I'd like a good excuse to use this. Yes. Suppose you would. If I can't charm you or plead with you, can I buy you? You could have prevented her death. You practically ordered it. What is it you want? You... Behind bars. <laughs> You're silly, but I'll go. For a while, it did look silly. Mapes and his men searched the apartment house from top to bottom and found no trace of the Todd loot. That is, until they found a movable cement block in the basement. Well, the Todd matter ended with a 90% recovery of the stolen items. About seventy thousand in dollars and cents. In lives, Gloria Tierney, one innocent bystander, and William Charles. For me, let's see. Expense account item fourteen, one hundred and sixty two dollars thirty cents. Hotel and board while in New York. Item fifteen, seventeen dollars and forty cents. Airfare and incidentals back to Hartford. Item eighteen, two hundred and thirty dollars, miscellaneous. Expense account total, one thousand ninety five dollars. Remarks nil. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, a music lesson on a priceless Amati violin. Music and mystery and danger. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by John Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in this week's cast were Vivi Janice, Barbara Fuller, Shirley Mitchell, Lawrence Dobkin, Frank Gerstle, and Marvin Miller. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. John, this is Harry Branson of Philadelphia Mutual. Harry, what are you doing in town? I'm not. At least not in your town. But you've got a case for me. Do you know anything about violins? Oh, don't tell me. So he opened up his fiddle case and out came a submachine gun, that it? John, that technique went out with prohibition. Now, seriously, this case contains a genuine Amati. Good. What's an Amati? One of the finest, most expensive violins ever made. This one was insured for $30,000. Was? Yes. Now, someone has to find it for us. What's more? Okay, Harry, I'm on my way. (laughs) 
tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. The following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Expense account item one, 1240, train fare and incidentals to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I took the train because Harry Branson didn't seem to be in any particular hurry, and I kind of like a slow look at the countryside this time of year. When I got to Philadelphia, I checked in at the Bellevue Stratford, shaved and showered, then went over to Harry Branson's office in the Security First building on Walnut Street. You deceived me, John. I thought when we talked long distance that you'd be here right away. But instead of flying down... Old oh, Sobersides Branson Possibly hadn't changed a bit. Time. Hair know. a little grayer than the last I time I'd seen him, perhaps. I hear further from but still the same you. serious lad who well, always anything, acted as though he was carrying the weight of the world on his shoulders. Now, I feel a deep personal concern over the whole matter because it was a man I put in this office myself who issued the policies, both of them. Two policies on this fiddle you were talking about? No, John. One on the Amati violin, $30,000. Yeah. And one on Ricardo Amerigo himself for $20,000. Who is Ricky? Who? Well, isn't that what you said his name is? I'm sure I didn't mention anyone by the... Oh, 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 Ricardo Amerigo. Yes, yes. Well, uh, where's he playing? The Purple Cat? Or uh, maybe Wee Willie's joint over on John, this, this man is a concert violinist, or was. He's disappeared. Now, please, no more levity. <laughs> Sorry, Harold. It's Harrison. Sorry, Harry. All right. I'm quite all right. Now, I, I realize that you have quite a sense of humor, John, but in a matter as important as this... Yeah, sure. Now, let's have the story. <laughs> Very well. A few years ago, Ricardo Amerigo was one of the world's leading concert violinists. As famous in London, Paris, Rome, as in the concert halls of this country. Uh -huh. Such virtuosity, almost unbelievable. I shall never forget one evening here in our Academy of Music. He had just finished a perfectly brilliant Vinyovsky. Amazing technical performance. Yeah, well... And uh... for an encore, he played Sarasate Zapatiado. Even more brilliant. Harry. Uh, but the audience wouldn't let him leave the stage. Ricardo Amarigo... Has disappeared. Oh, oh, yes. And you're in a hurry to get on with the case. I'm sorry. Now, thinking of his superlative performance that night carried me away. For... <clears throat> yes, he, he's dead. Disappeared. And the violin? No trace. Dead? He didn't say that before. I know. You see, there's no proof of death. No body. Disappeared. Well, uh, don't let me shock your finer sensibilities, Harry. Murder? We have thought of that, of course. Who's we? The Port Morris police. Port Morris, New Jersey, that is. Oh. Yes, you see, since Amerigo's car went through the bridge rail, crashed right through it and plunged into the river stream... Trying to tie Harry down to pertinent facts Morris that would help me in my investigation was, uh, well, futile. At least three times during the next half hour, he went off on glowing descriptions of violent recitals he had known. Heifetz, Selman, Chrysler, and so on. But he did come up with one of two things I wanted. First... Amerigo and his fiddle had been driving down from Philadelphia to some spot on the South Jersey seashore. Crossing an old wooden bridge over a little stream, an inlet from the ocean, the car had smashed through the guard rail and gone to the bottom of the inlet. The car, of course, was found. Amerigo and his violin, no. Second, and just as important, the name of the beneficiary of Amerigo's policies. Item two on expense account, one dollar even. Taxi to the Harnell Building, also on Walnut Street, in the office of Peter Corbin, Amerigo's booking agent. The building was plush, but Corbin's office was about as bare as I'd ever seen. An old beat-up desk, a battered filing cabinet, and a couple of straight chairs. That was it. Come in, Dollar. Come in. Sit up. Sit up. Corbin was chewing the stub of a cigar that he'd forgotten to relight for at least a couple of days. We made with the usual howdy do's Well, your man Branson told you exactly right, Dollar. I'm Ricardo Amerigo's sole and only beneficiary. Well, isn't that a bit unusual for a man's agent to be his heir? Or, uh, was it because you were all personal friends? I'm going to give it to you straight. <clears throat> I brought him where he go over to this country. Myself, my own sole expense. I actually gave him the build-up. I started his whole entire career. I kept him on top, all at my own expense. Well, didn't you collect a regular agent's commission on his earnings? Oh, sure, sure. Plenty more. Why kid about it? Sure, while he was working. What's that supposed to mean? Bottle. What? Yeah, started hitting the bottle. Bad, not good. And believe me, the word gets around fast. Instead of making me money, himself too, of course, he started costing me money. But you see, he never saved anything, even when he was earning big. You know how these artists are. Yeah, I've heard. Well, it's the same with all of them. He got in debt actually up to his ears. 
And nobody, no, no family, no relatives, nobody to pull him out. Nobody but me. Big-hearted Corbin. So you had him take out a lot of insurance and name you as beneficiary? Well, that was his idea, actually. Of course, he always did have the Amati insured. That's his violin. Oh, so I learned. Oh, you know about violins? No. Oh. Well, but the life insurance, that was his own idea. Double indemnity, all that sort of stuff. Double indemnity? Oh, yeah. But guess who had to dig up the moolah for the last couple of premiums? <laughs> Big-hearted the, Corbin. You're right. Not a bad investment, though, was it? What? Hey... A hey, couple of wait thousand a in premiums, and you stand to collect plenty. If we can find proof that he's dead, and if we can't oh, recover the... I don't like the... that dollar. I don't either, Corbin. It doesn't smell good. Oh, you think me, his yeah. own agent, actually rig something like that for one of my best friends? You think that... Listen, wise guy, even if I did have any any of a such idea, it'd be crazy. Anything actually is as is, is, is obvious as that. Well, sometimes the most obvious is the best cover. Oh, get out of here, dollar. Unless you want somebody to start collecting on your insurance. Even if it isn't you, huh? Get out! So help me. Yeah, pretty obvious. And every time you open your mouth... Oh, oh no, you don't. <laughs> Why is it that people who telegraph their punches are always the first to start swinging? Eh, I don't know. Anyhow, I left Corbin to pick himself up and start thinking about some alibis he might need. And in the camp back to my hotel, I did a lot of thinking myself. Sure, the obvious off times is the best cover-up. And yet it might be too obvious. Far too obvious. Branson here? Johnny Dollar here. Oh, uh, John, good. Listen, at least there'll be no double indemnity to pay in the Amerigo matter. For accidental death, that is. You see... Wait a minute. About an hour ago, you weren't even sure he's dead. Did somebody find the body? It, no, unfortunately, but I've just received a call from the Port Morris police. They completed their examination of Amerigo's car, uh, after they pulled it out of the creek, of course. I hope so. John, they found conclusive evidence of murder. Harry, I'll call you from Port Morris. <laughs> Expense account, item two. Subway, ferry, train, and bus fares to South Vineland, New Jersey. South Vineland, because Ad Bowles lived there, and I knew that if anything, anything at all happened in the heart of sunny southern Jersey, Ad would know about it. Retired and raising some of those wonderful South Jersey sweet potatoes and peaches with plenty of hired help, he amused himself by moseying around, getting to know everybody and everything that happened in his section of the state. He had an insatiable curiosity and money enough to keep it satisfied. Hi, you conniving, chiseling son of a gun. <laughs> I've been waiting for you to get here. What took you so long? Hey, what was that conniving, chiseling crack, son? We're still on expense account, aren't you? Yeah, sure. Sure, but... and so help me, nobody in history ever had the knack of padding out an expense account the way you can. And collect those fancy commissions on top. I, when I was a private investigator... Who is retired? <laughs> You call this retired 270 acres of sandy soil from which to try to wrestle the poor oh, living? Oh, no, wait a minute. That that Cadillac Eldorado out front, that belongs to one of the hired hands. 983 peach trees. And isn't that a landy field I see out there through the window? A lot of sweet potato land to be cultivated. Well, yes. Hey, why didn't you fly down or let me know and I'd have picked you up? Look, with all the time I have on oh, I my hands. I thought you said you were very yeah, busy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how long are you going to stay? So I can figure out where we'll go, uh, what we'll do. Ed, I'm on a case. Well, sure. Ricardo Amerigo and his priceless fiddle. Oh, no. It was easy. When I heard about him going over the bridge, I contacted Barney Peters of the Port Morris PD. From Barney, I learned all about the next of kin. It, his agent, that is. Pete Corbin. Right. And that boy at Philadelphia Mutual, Harry Branson... And I knew Branson wouldn't call anybody but you in on the case. So here you are. Still a private eye, aren't you, Ed? <laughs> you gotta have some way of killing time. And I suppose you have the whole case solved. Yep. Well, according to Harry Branson, who heard from the Port Morris police just before I left Philly, it was murder. Oh, you point killer. I thought I'd be the one to tell you that. No, sorry. The cops knew it first. Second, I told them. Huh? Yeah, I showed him where somebody used a hacksaw on the steering arm of Amerigo's car when they dragged it out of the creek. Aha, uh -huh, so that was it. Yep. And who wielded the hacksaw? Well, Pete Corbin. Who else? Why? 
Who else stood to benefit by Amerigo's sudden trip to the great beyond? No, 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 no. It's too easy, Ed. What's more, he's the only one who had constant and complete access to Amerigo's car. Why, he not only mothered little Ricky, clothed and fed him and kept him in booze, but he paid his rent, swept out his apartment, serviced his car. No, it's too easy. And Johnny, that car was even kept locked in Pete Corbin's own garage. And Corbin had the only key. Where did you learn that? From Corbin's landlord, by phone, of course. Said he thought Corbin did that so Ricky couldn't go out driving when he was drunk. And me? I think it was the other way around. He'd only let him drive when he was drunk, huh? It stood a good chance of smashing up what would look like accidental death. So that Corbin would collect the double indemnity. It's open and shut. <laughs> Any proof, Sherlock? Ha! Ah, just get to Corbin, throw it all at him, and break him down. Maybe he'll even find the hacksaw tucked up his sleeve. Ah, too easy. Any bets that it isn't Corbin? Yeah, yeah, I'll bet you. You name it. My commission on the case. I'll match it. Oh, and, uh... Plus your expense account. Look, Ed, I want to see that car and the bridge and the creek, anything else I can find. Sure, sure, I'll fly you down there. Then we can go on over to Atlantic City, hit some of the night spots. Your treat, you know, so we can build up the expense account enough for me to collect plenty. Ed Bowles had been a pretty good investigator in this day. Seldom going off half-cocked. Yet all his evidence was purely circumstantial. And where was the body? What's more, Pete Corbin acted anything but scared. Or so I thought until I put through a routine call to Harry Branson. He was worried. He had a right to be. Pete Corbin had packed a bag, jumped into his car, and disappeared. <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a soggy day in a soggy South Jersey swamp. And a discovery almost too good to be true. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Sam Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Sergeant Barney Peters, Port Mars Police. Oh, hi, Sergeant. Thought you and Adam Bowles were coming over here to look at the evidence in the murder of Ricardo Amerigo. We are. Ed's out warming up his plane. That's why I answered his phone. We got a visitor here in Port Mars. Who? A guy Ed thinks did the job. Pete Corbin, Amerigo's booking agent? That's right. In Port Morris? That's right. Well, are you holding him? I can't. No legal reason to, in spite of Ed's suspicions. Well, what's Corbin doing there? I don't know, unless Ed's right about him. Huh? And Pete knows you're on his trail. Well, what's that mean? Well, it could mean he's down here gunning for you. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Port Morris, New Jersey. Following is an accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Item three, one dollar even. For whatever it was, the local druggist recommended to pull my stomach back together after the flight in Ad Bull's private plane from Ed's farm in South Vineland to Port Morris. In a sense, I'm glad we flew. In a car with Ed at the wheel, we'd have been all over the road. As it was, we were only all over the sky. Oh, beautiful day for flying, isn't it, Johnny? Can't you hold a straight course, Ed? What's the matter with this ship? Oh, not a thing. 
I like to weave around a bit. I like the feel of it. You know, all that power under you. Yeah. Sure, you're not just trying to scare me into welching on our little bet? I'm going to win that bet, Johnny. Your commission on the case, plus all that goes on that well-padded expense account of yours. You just get busy and find the body. Why don't you forget your dark past as a private eye and stay retired? What? And leave an old friend like you floundering around with a case that's... Hey! Hey! You don't watch your steering. We'll be floundering around in those salt marshes down there. Sorry. But can't you see, Johnny, Pete Corbin, Amerigo's agent, has to be the heavy. He's the beneficiary of Amerigo's policy. Amerigo owed him a lot of money. Too easy. And Pete's the only person we know of who was with Amerigo constantly. You got motive, opportunity. Too easy, I tell you. But I wonder what under the sun Pete's doing in Port Morris. Ah, that we'll be finding out. We'll land there in a couple of minutes now. The little town of Port Morris was set on the edge of one of the wide salt marshes that border a lot of the South Jersey shore. Just a vast expanse of salt hay and dented with little coves and inlets. Soggy, swampy country. Ideal breeding place for the famous Jersey mosquitoes. And I guess for me, the ideal breeding place for trouble. Sergeant Barney Peters met us at the mucky little landing strip just outside town. And we headed out on a narrow, muddy road across the marshes. Yes, sir, Mr. Dollar. If I were you, I'd try to pin down this Corbin. Oh, where is he now? Back in town. Got Alf McCracken keeping an eye on him. Alf's the boy you saw Amerigo crash through the bridge that night, you know. Barney, I still wish you'd cooked up something to hold him. But what, Ed? Sure, Ed. Every bit of evidence you think you've got on Corbin is purely circumstantial. What else have you got to go on, John Boy? Oh, we'll see. We'll see. After I have a look at the bridge Amerigo busted through in his car. It's just up ahead a bit. Crosses the Lucky Hole Creek. I'd also like to know who could have... Well, I'd like to know what could have happened to his body. To that $30,000 Amati violin. You'll see. Just keep in mind that there's a mighty big flow of water in the creek. From the tide coming in and going out. Hmm. Tell me, Sergeant. Johnny, I checked it. Huh? Tide had just turned, was on its way out to the ocean at the time Amerigo's car went over the bridge. Right, Barney? That's correct, Dad. Right now, though, it's probably about as low as it'll... Whoa! What's the matter? Just pulling over to let this car that's coming pass us. Otherwise, one of us might shear off into the swamp. Yeah, these roads weren't meant for two-way traffic. John Poole's coming pretty fast for a road like this. He isn't careful. Hey, look, Pennsylvania plates. Huh? He's right. That's Corbin's car. Corbin, huh? Swing across the road. Block him. Wait. Son of a gun. Well, now, where's Corbin, all right? Well, then swing around. Go after him. On this road? He'd slide off into the swamp so fast. By the time we go on up to the bridge and turn, he'll be halfway back to Philadelphia, blasted. Well, we had the bird in hand and didn't know it. What are you going to do now, Johnny? Just exactly what we started out to You're do. losing valuable time. Now, if I were still oh, in this... Oh, Ed, racket... why don't you stay retired? We drove slowly on up to the bridge, stopped and got out. And although the tide was almost low now, it was easy to see how that rush of water would easily carry a violin or a body or most anything right out to sea. Or could it? The tide was running this same way when it happened. Out. Yeah. And the current was a lot stronger than it is now, so you can imagine what it would... Huh? Yeah. What's the matter, Johnny? Well, that, uh, that big bird nest, whatever it is, down there at the side of the creek, 50, 60 feet. Oh, that's just where the reeds and hay got matted up. It does look like... Hey. Yeah. If that isn't a fiddle case propped up on top of it... Sure looks like sure one. Sure it is. Sure. The tide was higher then. The fiddle stuck in those reeds. Wait here. Well, now, Johnny, don't. You come back here. Dollar! Dollar's like quicksand. Stay out of it! Well, you darn fool! It was come like quicksand, too. Don't let him make it! Black, glowy muck. And I sank into it up to my knees. I almost had to swim through it, hanging onto it, pulling myself along by the reeds and bulrushes. But half of this case hung on that $30,000 Amati violin. I wasn't going to let it slip out of my hands. A couple of times, I dropped into soft holes, almost up to my shoulders. But somehow, I kept going. Pulled the fiddle case off the pile of matted weeds and started back. I had used up most of my strength. With only one hand to pull, to pull myself along to... Ed! Ed! Johnny! Johnny, try and grab this rope! Here! Can't! Breach! Try it again, Ed. 
out. So help me, I hadn't. Not entirely, that is. Or I'd never have been able to grab the line that Ad Bowles threw to me. Needless to say, I took a lot of kidding from Ad and Barney Peters on the drive back to Fort Morris, especially since I didn't really know what had happened until I came to in the back seat of the car, clutching the fiddle case. Jerk. If you'd held on to the rope with a death grip you have on that violin case, we'd have got you out of that muck before you swallowed half the salt water in that inlet. Yeah, sure, sure. I'll say this for you, Mr. Dollar. You don't give up easy. The fiddle. The $30,000 Amati. At least I had half of this miserable case in hand in my hands. There'd be no insurance collection on that violin. And I saw it. What's the matter, Johnny? You passed out again? No. No, Ed. You should have cleaned me up before you piled me into this car. What? Look. Well, what is it? Piece of shirt. Ricardo Amerigo's shirt. Sad. Yeah, look, monogram on the pocket, R.A. And what looks like bloodstains. Hey, you're right. Where'd you get that? I must have picked it up when I picked up the fiddle. Well, at least it proves that Amerigo went down with his car. No doubt of it. What I didn't tell him was that the piece of cloth from Ricardo Amerigo's shirt was fastened to the violin case. Deliberately put there. But by whom? By Pete Corbin, Johnny. That's your man. Are you listening? Yeah, I'm listening. Beneficiary, confidant, caretaker of both Ricky Amerigo and his car. Who else could have sawed through the steering bar that made the car run off the bridge? And a guy who was smart enough to have it happen in this godforsaken salt marsh. Now, just a minute, Ed. Okay, Barney, in the heart of sunny southern Jersey, where he expected nobody would find car or body or even the fiddle until long after the insurance claim was met. Thanks to a tide that'd carry everything out to sea. For indeed, my friend, if your deputy, Alf McCracken, hadn't actually seen Amerigo's car slip through the bridge rail... Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah. If Pete Corbin had planned this whole thing, he would have made sure the Corpus Delecti would be found. Johnny, that's why he had the accident happen where somebody saw it. Yet that somebody, Alf McCracken, didn't see the fiddle float away, didn't see the body float away from the car... Stop it, John boy. You know as well as I do that this whole thing was engineered by Corbin. All right, tell me, investigator, what was he doing down here today? Lord knows, and I don't care. Probably to plant that piece of shirt. Johnny, I've given you all the help I'm going to on this case. From now on, you either follow my tip and lose your bet to me, or you don't and give yourself a black eye with insurance company. Boy. Johnny. Oh, yeah, Barney. That's a good detective. He'd have to be to retire on that nice farm of his over in South Vineland. He even broke a burglary case for me once here in Port Morris a couple of years ago, one I couldn't break myself. Ah, pastime. But you've got guts. I like you for it. Thanks a lot. And to me, the Pete Corbin theory looks, well, too easy. Oh, not you, Barney. That's what I'm trying to praise to that stubborn egghead sitting beside you. I'll lend you a suit of clean clothes, and you can chase this thing down the way you want to, without the dubious help of somebody who is just trying to win a bet from you. Traitor. And if I were you, I'd hunt up a few other people who knew Ricky Amerigo, besides his press agent, Pete Corbin. You are a mind reader. Gentlemen, I have only one thing to say. And, Johnny, it's addressed to you. When you finally find that Pete Corbin done it, you know where to send the check to me. At Port Morris, we learned that Alf McCracken had lost track of Corbin when the former dropped in at Osborne's Oyster House for a dozen on the half show. Hadn't even seen him take off in his car, much less leave in a hurry after spotting us on the road to Lucky Hole Creek. I took advantage of Barney's offer, borrowed a suit of his clothes, and accepted a ride from him to the crossroads of Woodvine where I could get a bus back to Philadelphia. Sure, half my job was done. I'd recovered the $30,000 Amati violin. But I could still hear the oh-so-pleasant voice of Ad Bowles, ex-investigator, not so retired. You know where to send the check to me, Johnny boy. 
Expense account item five, $4.95. Bus fare from Woodvine to Philadelphia. And believe me, it's a long bus ride. As soon as I got to my hotel and changed into my own clothes, I called Harry Branson at the insurance company. Mr. Branson here. This is Mr. Dollar, Mr. Branson. Yes, Mr. Uh, John. Yeah, I'm back at my hotel, music lover. And I've just won the $30,000 Amati. What? Yeah, I got the fiddle for you. Well, thank heaven you recovered it. Well, what of Ricardo Amarigo? Uh, later. Do you want the Amati? I'll be right over. Where is it, John? Where is it? Right here, Harry. Right here. Case, bow, and all. Oh, thank heaven. And by some miracle, it's dry as a bone and all in one piece. Voila. Oh, thank heaven. John. John? What's the matter? This? An Amati? Oh, no. Oh, no. Now, here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the results of a poker game. And believe me, there are times when the cards can be really stacked against you. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood, written by Sam Dawson. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Yeah, Pete Corbin, Dollar. I found your message when I got him, but I don't know why I'm returning your call after that lacing I took from you. Well, at least you haven't run out on us. Why should I? How would you like to explain what you were doing in Port Morris, New Jersey yesterday afternoon at the scene of the so-called accidental death of your client, Ricardo Amarigo? Oh, yeah, I, th- I, th- I thought that was you I saw in that car down there. It sure was. Are you in your office? Yeah, that's right. I thought you wanted well, to stay know... there. I do want to know. That and a lot of other things. I'll see you in about an hour after I've made another call. Okay, okay, I'll be here. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. To the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is an accounting of further expenses during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Expense account item six. $33.75. Dry cleaning and new shirts, socks and so on, including one pair of shoes to replace the ones I lost in the South Jersey swamp while rescuing what I thought was a priceless Amati violin in a muddy tidewater inlet called Lucky Hole Creek. But when I showed it to Harry Branson at Philadelphia Mutual, well, at least he promised to have an expert look it over and pass final judgment. That's the reason for item 7, 85 cents, taxi to Harry's office in the security first building. Oh, come in, John, come in. Hi, Harry. Well, what have you found out? Nothing yet, but I should hear from the violin man any minute. John, I do hope I was wrong. Sit down. Thanks. Harry, I could have committed mayhem when you told me that fiddle I picked up in the swamp isn't the Amati. To think you nearly drowned retrieving it. Oh, brother, that's putting it mildly. But I'm sure Foresto will know. Foresto? Uh, Foresto Sir Negliario, uh, however he pronounces it, the violin man. He really an expert? Well, he's the one who okayed the $30,000 policy on Amerigo's violin. Well, let's just hope this one's it. Did you learn anything in Port Morris? Only confirm what you'd already learned from Sergeant Peters down there. That someone had sawed through some steering connection on Amerigo's car before it crashed through the bridge? Yeah. Still no sign of the body? Nope. 
Oh, uh, a man named Adam Bowles called. Oh, he's an old friend. Used to be a private detective and just can't get it out of his system. Oh. Well, he called me, you know. I know. And I must confess, John, that I'm inclined to agree with him. That Peter Corbin, Aberigo's agent, did it? Agent and beneficiary, John. And apparently the one person who knew Amerigo well enough... I said it to Ad Bowles until I was blue in the face, Harry, and I say it again. Too easy. But who else? I don't know. That's what I came back here to find out. All the evidence... Circumstantial evidence. The kind of man that'd be a fool to let pile up against him if he really was guilty. Hmm. Even so... Harry, let me do it my own way, huh? What if this Corbin tries to skip out? Then will be the time to... He's kidding. Yes, uh, Mr. Sherney Arrow to see you, sir. Sherney Arrow. I, I, I knew that was it. Uh, send him in. Our man is here, John. Foresto? Yes, uh, sure. sure. Oh, well. Uh, come in, uh, <coughs> Foresto. Meet Mr. Dollar. Yes, yeah, um, How do you do, Mr. Dollar? You brought the fiddle? Yeah. Uh, right here on the desk. Well? Um, thank you. I'll open up the case. Well, is it? Mr. Bronson, Mr. Dollar, I'm sure. Well? Well, Mr. Cherniero? Cherniero. Look, you've only got to look. Now that I've cleaned away some of the mud and the salt from the swamp where it was found, we're lucky it did not do any real damage to change the appearance. But nobody could tell the way you gave it to me. Well, how about now that you've cleaned it up? Yes. Ah, you see here. The shape of the F holes. The curve to the valley. Yeah. The beautiful shape, the signs of age, and above all, here, you see, the label. Label? Through the F hole, you can see it. There. Nicola Amati. Then it is Amarillo's. See. Si. You're sure, Mr. Chaniero? Hmm. The label says. And Foresto says. Well, look, I talked with a fiddle player in the orchestra at my hotel last night. He told me there are literally thousands of imitations of every important violin ever made. Shape, size, label, and all. Now, listen, Foresto. Yeah. Tell me the truth. Do you really consider yourself an expert? Well, I'm, uh, I'm a seller of violins in my store. Violins, harmonicas, alcorinas, victrolas. How good are the violins you sell? Oh, so good ones. Some as high as $65. Harry, do you mean to tell me... With all due apologies, Foresto, do you mean to tell me he was your authority for a $30,000 policy on Ricky Amarigo's violin? Well, of course, a representative from the Wurlitzer Collection in Chicago verified Foresto's opinion at the time. Gee, we the Wurlitzer know every good violin in the world. Yeah, Harry, let me have it. I'll give you a receipt for it. I'll bring it back when I'm through with it. Whatever you say, John. I assume you want to check further on the authenticity. And you are right. John. Yeah. To put it bluntly... You've still not accomplished very much insofar as Amerigo himself is concerned. With this fiddle under my arm, I think maybe I will. See you later. Maybe Harry had been right in the very beginning. Maybe I should have known a little more about music, or more specifically, violins. Or maybe I should have left this aspect of the case to someone else and concentrated on the disappearance death of Ricardo Amerigo. Maybe I... Ah, uh, well... Expense account item eight, 80 cents. Taxi to booking agent Peter Corbin's office. All right, Dollar, let's not waste either your time or either mine. You want to know what I was doing? That's right, Corbin. Yeah, Marty. I found it right where you planted it, in that swamp near Port Morris. You actually found the tank? To... What do you mean where I planted it? What else were you doing down there in the South Jersey swamps? Is that where you found it? Well, you ought to know. But frankly, Corbin... I think you overplayed it a bit when you tucked part of one of Amerigo's monogram shirts there with it. I don't know what you're talking about. Actually, I mean it. Then what were you doing down there? And, brother, you better make it good. The same thing you were, trying to find out what happened to Ricky Amerigo. I tell you, Dalla, I was his best friend. It's a true fact. If his fiddle was down there, too, I didn't see it. I wish I could believe you. But the way it looks from here, you were willing to have the Amati violin found lying out there in that salt marsh because you couldn't get rid of it without exposing yourself. It didn't put any money in your pocket, the way you figure Amerigo's death will. The way it looks from here, Dollar, that's where you're wrong. Yeah? Yeah, actually wrong. If Amerigo's dead, I collect in his insurance as his beneficiary. That's what the policy says, but believe all me. Right, all right. But you think I wouldn't collect on the Amati fiddle, whether it was found or if it wasn't found. That's where you're wrong. What are you talking about? Because I'm also a beneficiary to his will. 
How do you know? <laughs> because I'm not only the sole and only heir in his will, I'm also the executive of... Uh, yeah, the executive of his estate, too. Oh. Yeah. So if I was the heavy, what would I take a chance leaving a $30,000 fiddle laying around in some swamp? Hmm? Cover up? $30,000 worth? All right, what did you do with a hacksaw? You mean somebody sawed up the fiddle? Oh, no, let me see. No, 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 easy, will you? Somebody sawed partway through a steering arm on Amerigo's car to make it crash. Murder? Oh, that's a pretty fair question. Oh, no, oh, no, darling, no. Oh, no, who would murder a nice, sweet guy like Ricky? Maybe he was a drunk, maybe he hit the skids, but he had no enemies. He couldn't have. Okay. Please. Maybe he was just a drunken bum, worthless. He threw away a concert career, but he was still, he was a gentleman. An actual gentleman. And he was a sweet guy. Nobody could have murdered him. Oh, no, no, darling, not Rick. Pete, Pete, would you? Who was it? Tell me, huh? Who was the lousy punk? I'll kill him. Okay, Pete, I believe you. I don't care whether you believe me or not. Will you tell me who done it? Pete. Rick. Pete, will you listen to me? I'm listening. Now, look here. Look here and tell me. Is this Ricky's Amati violin? Yeah, that's... That's it. Ah, oh, poor Ricky. Poor drunk. You're lover. sure? I'm sure. All right, Pete, I'm going to give it to you straight. All I ask is you now tell listen to me, me who... would you? We don't know who killed Ricky Amerigo. We haven't even found his body. The Port Morris police are still trying, of course, but it, it could have been carried by the tide through that in, inlet, the Lucky Hope Creek, right on out to the sea. Or, of course, it may appear somewhere along the creek. It'll take weeks to search that swamp thoroughly. Now, Anyhow, if they do find him, I want to see he gets a decent burial. Will you promise me? Okay, I'll try. But listen, will you? Because of the sawed-through steering arm, his death was made to look accidental. Double indemnity. And you're the beneficiary. He not only wasn't making you any money because his drinking kept him off the concert stage, but he owed you money, plenty. Now, that's a motive. As for opportunity, who else had as All much right, as you? Nobody, nobody, nobody. But I love the poor guy. I try to keep him alive you and get him back me, in his own. You told me, you told me, and I believe you. But the fact remains that the insurance company, the police, even a pretty smart private detective I know, all figure you for number one suspect. And they hope to accumulate enough evidence to move in on and you. And you're with them, No, huh? no. What? Well, yesterday right here you sure, told me. Sure, I know I did. But I've had time to think it out. Now, pinning it on you is just too easy, much too easy. I'll say it to your face, Pete. You're no metal giant. But only another fool would let circumstantial evidence like that pile up against him and then commit a murder like that. I may be wrong. Lord help you if I am and find out. But I think you're clean. I swear I am. And I'm going to play it that way unless I find solid reason to change my mind. Because, Pete. Yeah, Johnny. You're the one person who can help me in this case. I'll, I'll do anything. I, actually, anything. Just ask me. All right. Now, first, tell me where you were last Friday evening when Amerigo's car made that dive off that bridge. Alibi? That's right, brother, and you can be sure I'll check it. At Willie's. All right, who's Willie? Willie? Willie Elliott. He's a saxophone player. He's one of my clients. He was a friend of Ricky's, too. Well, where can I find him? What's his address? Uh, I'll write it down for you. We had a four-handed poker game. Who else in the game? Uh, well, Jerry Goldsmith, one... He know Ricardo, too? Oh, yeah. Composer, conductor, violin player. Fiddle player, huh? Who was yeah. the fourth? Uh, Eric Snowden. Who's he? He's a fiddle maker. He lives at his shop. I'll uh, write that down. Fiddle maker, did you say? Yeah. 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 Yeah, he was the sole and only man Ricky would ever let touch his Amati for repairs and fixing up, you understand? Who else were good friends of Ricardo's? Ah, uh, <laughs> while he was making it, plenty. Lately, nobody. You sure? Oh, nobody. Johnny, I know... Of course, he hung around a lot of bars. He was a regular. Give me a list. Well, let's see. There's a little place over on Pine Street called the Yellow Lamp. Yeah. Expense account item nine, three seventy. A quick sandwich for Pete Corbin and myself and a flock of phone calls to Pete's poker pals. Just to make sure they were in and available when I could get around to see them. I had to phony up an excuse for seeing each of them. A friend of Pete's just in from out of town suggested I give you a call, that sort of thing. And apparently it didn't arouse any suspicion. At least it was a start. And for the first time, call it a hunch or whatever you like, I felt I was going to get somewhere in this case. As it turns out, I was. Believe me. Now, here 
here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, a trio of musicians. The question, which one's story was playing a little flat? Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Sam Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. You, you are investigate. Hello, what'd you say? Who is this? You are investigating Ricardo Amerigo. Yeah, that's right. I'm investigating the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Who are you? Hello? Hey, listen, do you have some information, a tip on the case? Who are you? Hello? Hello. Hey, what is this, a gag? Yeah. Or is this supposed to be some kind of a cockeyed threat, a warning for me to get off the case? Believe me, this is no gag. Hello? Hello? <laughs> Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. To the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is an accounting of further expenses incurred during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. Expense account item 10, $21 even, for drinks, for me alone. And believe it or not, I'm cold sober. But the least I could do was buy one at each of the bars on the list Pete Corbin gave me. A list of all the places Ricardo Amerigo used to hang out before his disappearance in a South Jersey swamp. In spite of all the circumstantial evidence pointing his way, I still wasn't convinced Corbin had engineered an accident to kill Amerigo. Pete had also given me a list of Amerigo's closest personal friends, three of them. I told them I'd see them later. Meanwhile, I hoped to learn something helpful from the places where he apparently spent most of his time during his last few months on this earth. But the result can pretty much be summed up by the last bar on the list, the Hangover Club. Yeah, cost you 80 cents. Here, keep the change. Oh, thanks. Yeah, it's just like I tell you, mister. You come in here, buy a few drinks, sit and drink them, leave. Well, uh, didn't he ever talk to anybody? <laughs> Not even me. Just sit here and get plastered. Told one of his friends to come in and drag him away. Who? Oh, did you know any of them? Oh, sure. Well, he had your saxophone player at the Crystal Room. Oh, who else? Jerry somebody, fiddle player. Jerry Goldsmith. Yeah, they're on my list. Huh? Anybody else? No. Oh, yeah, away, sure. His agent, Pete Corbin. Yeah, that's... Hey, if you knew that, why'd you ask me? I've heard the same thing exactly 20 times so far today. Yeah, well, I'll say this for them. They must have loved Amerigo. They might have fought and argued with him when they caught him in here, but it was all for one thing, to try and straighten him out. But, mister... He was too far in. Yeah. Yeah, shame for a talent like him, concert violinist. To hit the skids the way he'd done, but nobody couldn't see that. The story had been exactly the same in every bar on the list. Apparently, the only friends, the only associates that Ricardo Amerigo had had were those Pete Corbin had named. Expense account item 11, 110. Cab fare to the apartment of William Elliott over on Callowell Street. Same story. No new names of friends or even acquaintances. He and Corbin and Goldsmith and the old English violin maker, Eric Snowden, had known Amerigo for years, good times and bad, had all tried to help him, straighten him out, were deeply grieved over his death. Item 12, 570, cab to a suburb called Lenark to see Jerry Goldsmith, where I'll admit I expected to get the same story, the same names, no more, no less. This time I took the Amati violin with me. Hi. Who are you? 
I'm Johnny Dollar. Oh, yes, you called. Come in. Friend of Pete Corbin's, you said. Uh, sit down. Mr. Goldsmith, I'll get right to the point. I'm an insurance investigator, and I that came in... That violin case. That that looks like Ricardo's. It is. And, and the Amati? Yes. Oh, thank God. I found it down on a South Jersey swamp where Amerigo's car plunged off the bridge. It had been lying there, hidden by the Marche for several days. Is it all right? May I see it? Well, one reason I brought it along was so you could substantiate identification. I make no bones about it, Mr. Dollar. I coveted this violin like nothing else in the world. I've played many fine instruments, strads, guanieri, even this, my stainer. I see. But Ricardo's Amati, it... There was something between that violin and myself that could exist for no one else. Not even Ricardo Amerigo when he was at his greatest. And when he started his, his terrible downfall. You uh, wanted it even more, huh? Yes, more than anything else in the world. Enough to kill for him? <laughs> Mr. Dollar, I should kill you for even thinking such a thing. I love Ricardo. Okay, sorry. The fact remains, somebody sawed through a steering arm on his car. Oh, I still can't believe that. No one could have killed Ricardo, no one. Only three others beside myself even knew Ricardo these past few years. Corbin, Elliot, and Eric Snowden. Pity him, feed him, clothe him, try to fight him away from the liquor that had ruined his brilliant career, yes. Even hate him at times for what he'd done to his life, but murder... I'm sorry. May I? Sure. It, uh, is the Amati. Yes. Yes. I know it as well as I know my own. May I play it? Sure. What's the matter? I don't know. Mr. Dollar, it, it isn't here. The tone, the brilliance, the response, it isn't here. Something's wrong. You're sure this is the Amati? Oh, of course I'm sure, but something's wrong. Something's happened to it. It, it, it isn't the same. Well, you think the dampness of the swamp might no, have done... No, no, you can see. It's, it's all right, but... But it isn't. Well, I I don't know anything about violins. Well, there are no cracks, no marks, no damage. Uh, well, even the sound post. But you're sure it's Ricardo Amerigo Zamati? Yes, yes, I told you so. I couldn't possibly be mistaken. But something is... Mr. Dollar... Well? I, I don't know. You know something? I don't either. <laughs> I'm afraid I left Jerry Goldsmith rather abruptly and in a rather distressed condition. But I had plans, and the sooner I could carry them out, the better. Item 13 on expense account, 420, taxi fare back into town at the shop of Eric Snowden, violin maker. The only man who'd been allowed to touch Ricardo Amerigo's Amati, except, of course, for the music store owner who'd cleaned it up after I found it in the swamp. Yeah, it was possible he had done something to it that would destroy its tone. But for some reason or other, call it a hunch if you like, I hope not. Snowden's shop was located on a colorful little side street, really not much more than an alley called Eisminger Street, right in the middle of one of the busiest sections of the city, surrounded by skyscrapers, office stores, and all the traffic that goes with them, this one little alley. Except for Snowden's place, the tiny buildings packed side by side are all residences, left over from years gone by when this was a residential section, and still unspoiled by the bustling activity around them. Thank you, Mr. Romandy. And I'll be sure to hear you at the Academy of Music Saturday night. Uh, sir, sir. Mr. Snowden? Uh, yes, I'm Eric Snowden. But that, that violin case... I'm Johnny Dollar. I fought. Oh, please come in. Uh, Mr. Dollar. That's right. It's Ricardo Amerigo's. It's been found. Uh, please let me... Mr. Snowden, I'm an insurance investigator. Part of my job has been recovery of this violin. It's possible loss was the most heartbreaking thing I ever contemplated, but you found it. I uh, think so. You think? I don't understand. 
Well, here, take it. Examine it. Yes, but uh, not here. Come, we'll go up to my workroom on the second floor, where I can check it thoroughly. I'll lock this front door so we won't be disturbed. Now, come with me, please. I can't believe it. It's so wonderful you found it. It would have been a terrible loss to the world. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, you're not a violinist yourself? No. I'm afraid the only violin music I know is what I hear. And... Uh, now, here we are. Oh, quite a shop. Most of the finest violins in the world have been here, one time or another. The Stradivarius of Yasha. It was quite a shop. The, violins the walls were lined with fiddles in the making Christ, and with tools. Eugenia some familiar and I some that were... Time, Wait a minute. Hacksaws. A couple of them small and delicate, Boy, but one a big one and dirty. As Eric Snowden turned away to open the violin case, I ran my fingers over the blades. Yeah, there was grease on one. Axel grease. Now here. Ah. Ah. Well, Mr. Snowden? Yes, Mr. Dollar. This is Ricardo Amerigo's violin. You're certain of that? Eh? Do you think that I, of all people, wouldn't know? Mr. Dollar, aside from Ricardo himself, I am the only person who has touched this magnificent instrument for years now. I must confess, I resent your least question of my judgment. All right, I'll be honest with you. I don't pretend to know much about violin, so I had somebody play it a while ago. Sacrilege. All right, be that as it may. It didn't sound to him or even to me like a $30,000 violin. And whom did you permit to lay hands on this priceless instrument? A friend. I should be horsewhipped. Only an artist. A great artist should be permitted to handle a thing like this. But I suppose you uh, understand that, Mr. Dollar. I don't suppose you... Well, go on. Mr. Dollar, someone has tampered with this. Oh. Of course it doesn't sound right. Did this friend of yours presume to be a violin maker, too? What do you mean? The sound post, the placement of the bridge. Of course it doesn't sound right. Now... Now, why does somebody have to... Do you want to answer that? Uh, no, no, let them wait. This is more important. No wonder you or your friend or anyone else question the validity of this instrument. Hey, whoever that is down there, he really wants you. Look here, a simple adjustment here and here. Oh, bother. Go ahead, I'll wait. All right, I shall be right back. It was a quick suspicion when I spotted the hacks on the wall, and I couldn't forget the warning over the phone. While Snowden waited on his customer, I poked around the shop some more, looking for goodness knows what. And I found exactly nothing. No doubt Snowden was telling the truth. Until I started to sit down to wait for him, and as I pulled over a stool, I knocked open the door of a cabinet next to his workbench. I started to close it again, and then I saw it. Hanging there on the hook was a violin. I grabbed it out of the cabinet and held it under the light beside the one in Amerigo's case. I held them up together. It was unbelievable. The shape, the color, the markings, nicks on the little pegs you tune them up with, a spot of stain on the scroll, even a tiny, almost indiscernible scratch on the back, an old pencil mark on the inside near the label. It was impossible, but it was true. These two violins were absolutely identical. Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, well, it's a wind-up. But believe me, a wind-up with a real twist. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Sam Dawson, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. John? John, this is... Don't tell me, Harry Branson at Philadelphia Mutual. Yes, yes, it is. Uh, listen, John, I know you found his Amati violin. Are you sure? But Ricardo Amerigo himself, nothing. 
And after all, there's not only the $20,000 policy on him, but... What do you mean, am I sure? Are you sure it was Amerigo Zamati violin I found? Why, of course... What do you mean? What if it wasn't? What if it was just an imitation? John, stop it. That's impossible. What do you mean? That $30,000 well-insured fiddle I picked up in the South Jersey swamps may be a phony. Oh, no. For heaven's sakes, come over here to the office and tell me... Oh, take it easy, Harold boy, until I've had time to find out a few things. John? See ya. Tonight and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yes, truly... Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. Location, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. To the Philadelphia Mutual Liability and Casualty Company. Following is a final accounting of expenditures incurred during my investigation of the Ricardo Amerigo matter. When Ricardo Amerigo's car was hauled out of a swamp somewhere near Port Morris, New Jersey, there was no sign of his body. Only a sawed-through steering arm on the car that indicated somebody had done him dirt. However, I did find the fiddle, the $30,000 Amati that had helped him become one of the world's top concert violinists. Anyhow, with a fiddle under my arm, I ended up at the shop of violin maker Eric Snowden for final confirmation that it was the genuine Amati that I'd found. This Eric confirmed. However, while we were in the second-floor workroom of his shop on Eisminger Street talking about the fiddle, somebody pounded on the street door downstairs. Oh, bother. I'll be back in a moment, Mr. Dollar. And that's when I accidentally, and so help me, it was accidental, I knocked open the door of a cabinet and discovered another violin, identical in every respect with the one I'd found in the swamp at the scene of Amerigo's accidental death. Okay, so I did exactly what you would have done. I put the one in the cabinet into Amerigo's case and the one from the case into the cabinet. One of them was the genuine Amati. But which one? I'm sorry, Mr. Dollar, but he was so insistent. I thought he was one of my, uh, shall we say, better clients. As it turned out, it was just a youngster who wanted to see one of the new G-strings. A youngster? (laughs) Oh, I see you're joking. But now, let me take this magnificent instrument, readjust the sound post and bridge so that... No, no, wait, Mr. Snowden. Eh? Uh, It's later than I thought. There are some things I must do immediately. Suppose I come back here later. Very well. Meantime, I shall make the adjustments on the Amati to restore it. No, no, I've got to take it with me. But I don't understand... There are a few things in this case I don't understand right this minute, but uh, I hope to before very long. Uh, Mr. Dolly, you talk in riddles. Why don't you leave the violin? No, thanks. Me? I'll see you later. Uh, but, but please be careful with it. If anything should happen to that priceless... Don't worry. Nothing will happen to it. I found that I'd almost spoken too soon, for I pounded down the stairs across the floor of the store and out of the door without the caution the book says one should exercise when leaving a suspect in a case. I'd no sooner got out on the street... It was a flower pot, big enough to have killed a horse in its fall from the upper story window ledge. Oh, no. Good heavens, wait, Mr. Dollar. That was an accident. But I didn't wait. Expense account item 14, 10 cents. Phone call to Harry Branson at the insurance company to have the police put a man on Eric Snowden's shop immediately to make sure he wouldn't try to skip. Item 15, 750 for a cab to the house of fiddle-playing Jerry Goldsmith out in Lanark. Mr. Dollar. Hello, Goldsmith. I didn't expect it. But you left in rather a hurry earlier. Sorry, I had to keep a date. Hey, look, Jerry. When I was here before... You still have the violin? Yes. Yes, when I was here earlier and you played it, you didn't seem to think it was really Ricardo Amerigo Zamati. No, no, I, I didn't say that. At least... Well, I... at least it didn't sound like it when you played it. Yes, Mr. Dollar, that's right. Oh, uh, now, think a minute. You were a bit upset, excited, uh, whatever you want to call it, when I brought it to you. Yes, that's true. Nevertheless, and I, I think you were also afraid I might have suspected you of Amerigo's murder when you admitted his violin was the one thing you wanted more than anything else in life. Except, of course, to have Ricardo straighten out. Become himself again. Become the artist again. Deserve to have this... Oh, I don't know. Whatever I say seems to make it sound like a... I don't know. I know, look, Jerry. Calm down, will you? I'm not trying to pin a murder rap on you. Calm down and do something for me, will you? Why, yes, of course. What? Here. Have you had something done to it to restore the tone it used to have? It hasn't been touched by anyone else since I laid my hands on it. But I want you to play it again. Yes, of course I will. 
But didn't you say that some old fool with a music store cleaned it up? Jerry, it hasn't been touched by anyone else since I laid my hands on it. Now play it. All right. Go ahead, Jerry. It's, it's the Amati. A beautiful, wonderful... Funny. I never realized what a violin could... Can you hear me, Jerry? Yes. Yes. And to think it's taken something like this to lead me to a killer. Expense account item 16, 420. Cab to Philadelphia Mutual, the office of Harry Branson. But if you're right, John, you mustn't go out there alone. Don't you understand if he's the man who planned the murder of Ricardo Amerigo? He wouldn't stop... Yes, yes, I had the police put a man out there to cover his shop. But, John, I still think... It Expense account item 17, sixty. The buck was a tip for going through a couple of red lights. Back to the shop of the violin maker, Eric Snowden. Mr. Dollar. Hi, Mr. Snowden. I'm afraid I left you rather abruptly a while ago. Vincent, Mr. Dollar, it's you. I, that, that, that near accident when you left that flower pot, I, I don't know how it... Possibly could have shifted on the window ledge up there. On the third floor window ledge of this little combination store, workshop, and home of yours. That much I did notice while I was ducking it. If it had come off a second floor window, you know I might have suspected you of giving it a helpful shove. Oh, good heavens, Mr. Dollar, you can't possibly mean that. All right, forget it for the moment. Uh, but how can Let's you... go up to your workshop on the second floor. Come on. Well, well yes, of course. Uh, but uh, may I ask why? I want to show you something... And I think you know what. No, I certainly don't. Unless something has happened to the Amati. Oh, something certainly has. You damaged it since you were here. No such luck. Uh, you... Mr. Dollar, please, what are you talking about? Okay, here. Now tell me the truth. Is this Ricardo Amerigo's Amati violin? Yes. Yes. I've told you so. You're sure? Uh, of course I'm sure. You know something? You aren't, but I am. What? Now open that cabinet there beside your work table. What for? Because I tell you to. But, but I... Uh, just what are you getting at, Dollar? Are you going to open it or shall I? No. Get out of here. This is my shop, my place. You you can't do this sort of thing to me. Would you rather the police did? They're on their way. The police? But I... Well? There's no need to open it. Ricardo Amerigo Zamati is in it. Well, that's where you're wrong. This is the Amati. In this case, the one in the cabinet is the identical copy of the Amati that you made. Yes, Mr. Dollar. Why, Snowden? Because the loss of this priceless instrument would have been unthinkable. $30,000 insurance on it. Oh, money doesn't buy a violin like this. It must be played by an artist, by many artists, like the artist Ricardo was. So, so when Ricardo disappeared... Or was murdered? When Ricardo disappeared, I had to make sure that the Amati would, would still... I didn't murder him. Isn't this the hacksaw that cut the steering rod on his car? Well, Snowden, isn't it? Yes. Uh, no, I and mean... And because of it and your crazy plan to keep the real Amati, you and you alone are going to take the rap for Amerigo's murder. No, no, please. Ricky. Ricky? you, sir. That's right, Mr. Dollar. I'm Ricardo Amerigo. You're what? The dirty, drunken has-been that started all this. Sawed through the steering rod on my car, wrecked it in the swamp, left some of my clothing there. That phony fiddle was my idea. Not to collect the insurance on it, not that alone. 
but to make sure it could come back again, be played again by somebody that deserved to play it the way I, the way perhaps one time I deserved to play it. But, but Ricardo. A man disappears, murder, or whatever. There's a fuss about it for a while, and it's over. But this, no. No, this must live. This violin. You will now. And the world will be the better for it. But you, and this apparent murder. The insurance was my last hope of paying back Pete Corbin, my agent, and the others who tried so hard to straighten me out. Pay back some of the money and the heartbreak they spent on me. Or let your insurance company pay them back. Because I never could. I couldn't even leave my hiding place here in Eric's house. Because I knew that sooner or later he'd pity me enough to give me more of the drink that's been all I've been living for. Eric, God bless him. Eric knew, of course, but only he. Be kind to him, if you can. Ricky. That's all, Mr. Dollar. Oh, unless... Will you buy me a drink before you call in the police? Expense account item 17, 850. One bottle of the best I could buy before I called in the police. Item 18, hotel in Philadelphia, miscellaneous fare, back to Hartford. Total expense account, 182.65. Remarks? No insurance payment necessary on either the Amati or the man. And I guess he really was a man. More than he knew. What the courts will do about him and about Eric Snowden, well, the courts will do. And I'm glad I have to have no part in it. You know, it's funny. Somehow I think I have a little better appreciation for music now than... Oh, well. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, there'll be another intriguing story for you beginning next Monday night. Next week, the Duke Red Matter... A racehorse that could only be stopped by a killer. And the killer didn't stop with horses. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote this week's story. Heard in the cast were Harry Bartell, Lawrence Dobkin, Victor Perrin, Barney Phillips, Forrest Lewis, Eric Snowden, Herb Vigran, and James McCallion. Musical supervisor and violinist, Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs>